Shalom and welcome to Temple Talks. This is Yitzhak Rube speaking to you from south of Jerusalem. Here in the holy, beautiful, sacred land of Israel today is the 27th day of the month of Tishrei, 5785. It's October 29th, 2024. This coming Shabbat we read the second parasha, the second Torah reading of the book of Genesis, parashat Noach. Uh, you might know Noah as Noah in your language, but in Hebrew it's Noah, spelled with a het at the end, Noah, uh, from the word um, uh, to be uh, calm or, or comforted, to comfort, because God was comforted by the birth of Noah, because he was a good person. We'll be talking about that very soon. Parshat Noah begins in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 9, concludes chapter 11, verse 32. And this coming Shabbat is also Shabbat Mavarchin, meaning it's the Shabbat. Actually, it's Shabbat Rosh Chodesh. Um, I'm sorry, it's not Shabbat Mavarchin, it's Shabbat Rosh Chodesh already, because last week was Shabbat Mavarchin, and this Friday and Shabbat are both part of a two day Rosh Chodesh, the new month of Cheshvan, also known as Mar Cheshvan, the second month of the Hebrew calendar. If we begin with Tishrei, um, you probably are aware that there's more than one New Year. Uh, in the Hebrew calendar, but of course Tishrei is the month of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shemini Atzeret, slash Simchat Torah, which we just completed last week. 22 days of holidays. It's intense, it's uplifting, it's wonderful, it's the great way to start the year, and it's also exhausting. And by the time that uh, uh, Shemini Atzeret, uh, slash, I say slash because it's also known as Simchat Torah, by the time they are over, um, you're ready to really um, get into the year. And uh, even though the year started 22 days earlier, really the day after Simchat Torah is it's like the first day of the new year, and you've been spiritually uplifted, recharged, and cleansed, and ready to go. Last week, I apologize, last week I did not do a temple talk uh, just because it was Sukkot still, and um, I wasn't intending not to, but... Um, I was very busy on Sukkot, and in fact, the evening that I was intending to record Temple Talk, I was invited out uh, to a friend's sukkah, and uh, you cannot refuse an invitation to a friend's sukkah, and of course, we had a great time. So, yeah, I did not get to Temple Talk, um, so we have things to talk about. Also, Simchat Torah slash Shemini Yetzirah ended on Thursday evening which meant the next evening was already uh, Shabbat, Shabbat Parshat Bereshit, Bereshit, of course, in the beginning, um, the first of the, the beginning of the book of Genesis. And uh, so I didn't have time to talk about that at all. So we're going to talk this week a bit about Genesis and Noah um, and uh, try to make our way into the new year, the new year of reading from the Torah is, of course, we conclude the five books of Moses with the pe- last parasha of the book of Deuteronomy called Zotah Bra- Bracha, when Moshe blesses all the tribes of Israel, and right before he goes up to Mount Nebo, looks into the land that he will never enter into himself, and uh, dies. Uh, he, uh, God uh, told him this was his last, his last day, his last moment, and he, he ended his day on, uh, on a high looking into the land, and then God took his took his soul, and uh, that was it for Moshe uh, on this earth. And then we immediately on, sh- on Simchat Torah began to read Parshat Bereshit, beginning with the very, very beginning. Bereshit bara Elohim, et ha-shamayim v'et ha-aretz, v'aretz ha-yetah tohu v'avohu, v'choshech al p'nei tohum, v'ruach Elohim merachefet al p'nei amayim, Vayomer Elohim yehi or vayhi or vayar Elohim et or ki tov vayavdel Elohim bena or bena choshech vayikra Elohim la or yom or la choshech kara laila vayhi er vayivoker yom echad. In the beginning of God's creating, we're going to talk about that translation in a minute. Bereshit bara Elohim. Oftentimes it's translated translated simply as in the beginning God created. Here it's translated uh, in the beginning of God's creation, the heaven of, of the heavens and the earth. When the earth was astonishingly empty, tohu vavohu, oftentimes that's translated as uh, 
um, as, as void and chaos, uh, with darkness upon the surface of the deep and the divine presence, Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, hovered upon the surface of the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light that was good, and God separated between the light and the darkness. God called to the light day, and to the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Okay, we have a lot to cover today, uh, so we're going to not overly dwell on anything, but we're going to try to cover a lot of ground. Bereshit bara Elohim. The word Bereshit, uh, if, if it had really simply been stating in the beginning, it would be Bereshon bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created. But that's not how it's stated. It's Bereshit, which means it could be translated as in the beginning of. Here they say in the beginning of God's creation. In the beginning of something or or at the start of things. So it doesn't necessarily mean that this is the very beginning, beginning, beginning. It's the beginning of what the Torah wants to share with us. It's the beginning of what God wants us to know about creation. Let's look about, think about it. He created the heavens and the earth, and there was darkness upon the surface of the deep. Uh, the deep is the translation of the word hamayim, which is, literally means water. So there's water here. God hasn't created the water. Where's water from? Now, water didn't exist alongside God. God is one. God is unique. So the water came from somewhere. So here's this, uh, when, we, when we read carefully, we understand that, that we're not really starting at the very, 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 very beginning here. If there is, if we can understand, I, I would think the Torah is telling us that you, you can't even, you can't even imagine the beginning, the beginning, the beginning. So we have, we also have darkness. Where's the darkness come from? Is darkness simply a lack of light, or is darkness a thing that God created, or whatever? These are questions which we could go into, and of course our sages have gone into them for thousands of years, and, and there's all different understandings, um, from, from more simple understandings to deep, deep secrets, of mystical secrets of, of creation, and um, it is th- th- these first few psukim, first few verses of the book of Genesis, uh, could be a lifetime of study. And um, there are actually, uh, today there are uh, a Jewish physicists who are also physicists and also Torah scholars and, and, and deeply devout uh, Jews who both understand the modern uh, scientific understanding of creation and they also understand what, or they they, they try to understand what the Torah is trying to tell us. And it's clear that, you know, some people say, oh, science, you know, this is nonsense. It's science. Let's go by science. Science is one way of looking at creation, one way of looking at the world, but it's not the only way of understanding the world, how it works, why it works, and what is the compelling force and intention and will behind all existence. Torah is another way of understanding those things. And the Torah itself, the, the words of the Torah, are here to teach us, to open up our hearts, to open up our minds, to allow us, through our own efforts, to gain insight into the world in which we live, why God created the world, what our part, what our role is in the world, what we're intended to do, um, and how we can serve God by living up to our own selves, our own intended purposes. Why was I created? You know, God creates lots of people. Well, we're all very much similar, but we're all, each one of us is unique. And it's in that uniqueness, as well as that similarity, that, that we need to dive into and learn and, and try to understand and try to gain our reason why God created us, why God created me. There is a, a famous Hasidic rabbi, and I'm... Um, I apologize. I can't. Uh, his, his name's on the top of, tip of my tongue, but I can't remember it. And he's not the only one. But he said that when when you die and you go to give judgment, God's going to say, uh, um, "Did you achieve the purpose for which you were created?" You know, that's that's the answer. You, that's the question you need to answer. So that is what you need to pursue in life, that to try to understand why you're, why you're here, 
and uh, what the and and how to uh, fulfill that purpose. There's another famous story, sim similar, similar, same really lesson uh, of a man named Zusha, and uh, Zusha dies and goes to heaven, and Zusha says, you know, uh, God says. Zusha says, you know, I, I could have been better. I could have been like Moshe. I could have been like like, like uh, David. I could have been... He names all these different people. I could have been like this one. I could have been like that one. And God says, all I ever wanted you to be was, was, was Zusha. Right? You have to be yourself. Anyway, we're not going to stick on that. We're going to continue to move forward. God creates. And my point simply being at these first few verses is that when you read Genesis and when you read the entire Torah, you have to understand that Torah is not trying to dictate to you um, uh, uh, what happened. It's trying to tease you into understanding and getting a deeper understanding and, and being a part, really, of what happened. You're part of this, right? Man's not created yet, but you're still part of this. We all come from the same source. Anyway, God creates man, and um, as I mentioned last week in the, uh, I wrote last week in, in uh, a post that uh, I put out on, on Friday afternoon uh, uh, about Parshat Bereshit, that God created man, and God said, everything was good up to that point. God created the world, it was good. Good, good, good. Seven times God says good, the seven times says Tov Ma'od, very good. Perfect world, and God sees man, and he puts man in the Garden of Eden, and man is as happy as a lark. Couldn't be happier. He's got everything he needs, just as God intended. Everything he needs. If he's hungry, he just reaches his hand out, grabs. He doesn't have to grab the fruit from the tree. He can grab the bark, because our sages say that in the Garden of Eden, every part of the tree was edible. And God says it's not good for man to be alone. Well, what, what's not good about it? And did man complain? No. Man has, he hasn't said a word. He's happy. The only thing that opens his mouth is to eat. And that's the whole problem. God wants man to speak. God created man. Man is the crown of, the crown jewel uh, of all creation. And what lifts man above all other living things is man's ability to speak, to articulate, to talk, to connect to others, to connect to God, to, to, to speak his thoughts, to speak his dreams, to speak his passions. And... That's what God wanted from Adam. It wasn't good for Adam to be alone because he had no one to talk to. Now, God wanted Adam to talk to him. But as I said, Adam was, the world was complete for him. He had nothing to say. So when God took man, who at that point was male and female, he created them, and split man into two separate beings, male and female, each one had a, had a chisaron, each one had a, something missing, a part was missing. And so there was a, a need to to speak up and need to communicate. So God created, when God separated man from man into man and woman, God created man's need to speak, to articulate, and to articulate not only to his help meets, um, the, you know, our significant other, but also to speak to God. And yeah, soon enough, you know, as soon as, as woman was created, man and women are speaking and then speaking to God. And even Cain, Cain uh, who was known for, for two things, one for a, an offering that, that wasn't pleasing to Hashem, and that's a whole topic that, that's, again, we could spend hours, hours, hours talking about without really coming to a resolution because it's what, you know, he made an offering and God wasn't pleased with it. There's a lot of reasons given for that. Um, we're not going to go into that. But then, of course, God says, what's the problem? You know, why are you so sad? And you can overcome this. Just like, don't let your yetzirah, don't let your evil urge take control of you. In fact, our sages say that our evil urge can help us to accomplish what we need to accomplish in life if we have shlita, if we have control over it. It's, a, it's an impulse. It's a very important, it's a very strong impulse and in fact, there is a, a, a story that at one point, some uh, one of our sages in ancient times, one of our wise men, um, he asked of God to get rid of the evil urge so that people would stop doing bad things. And God said, okay. And he got rid of the evil urge and nobody did anything. 
right? Nobody got out of bed because what you know, there's no urge to do anything. There, there's the evil urge. It's it's basically it's our it's our urge in life to live. It only becomes evil if we allow it to stray from the path. So anyway, um, Kayan is told you can overcome it. He doesn't overcome it and kills his brother. And then, of course, God says, where's your brother? This was God's second question to man. First question was of Adam. He said, where are you? Aeka. Where are you? That's the most important question God can ask of us and we can ask of ourselves. Where am I? What am I doing here? What's my purpose? And then the second question, it's equally essential, is Aye Achicha, where's your brother? Where is your brother? Because we're not here alone. We need one another. We need to work with one another. We need to love one another. So these are the two essential questions of every every living living being, I think, every living person and needs to ask themselves uh, constantly so that we don't um, get lost along the way as as Adam did and as Cain did. So then, as we know, uh, the the Parshat Breshit, the Torah goes on to list the first, com- continues to list the first ten generations of man and it ends uh, with the um, birth of Noah, uh, the son of Lamech or Lemech, and Noah is a comfort, and uh, it's the comfort. Uh, Lemech says he will comfort us um, from the. What is? I'm going to go look for it right here. Get the actual verse, if I may. Sorry, I didn't have this ready. Um, to 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 by Yikra et Shmo Noach lemo ze. Yenachamenu mi maasenu umi itzbon yadenu mina adama ashe erra hashem. And Lamech lived, Lamech named his son um, Noach, meaning uh, comfort or rest, saying, This one will bring us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands, from the ground which Hashem has cursed, had cursed. So there's no explanation f- in the Torah for why. Why. Uh, how Noah was a comfort, how he, he comforted the people from the cursed land. Uh, Midrash um, understands from this that Noah actually invented the plow. Now, we learned earlier that the sons of Cain, uh, Tuval and Tubal Cain and, and Yuval, uh, created, um, respectively, they created, um, one was the, the shepherd, one created uh, musical instruments, clearly the, the pipe, uh, you know the, f- the the famed pipe that uh, that um, and the lyre that uh, that shepherds would play, and the other one too, Vulcan created metal. Um, or you know he understood the art of of metallurgy and and taking raw materials and turning it into metal. And of course, um, that was also the beginning of weaponry because I mean of serious weaponry because now you can make weapons out of metal, but also it. Uh, would seem that that was would have been the material that Noah would have used to create his plow, but that is midrash, and then we're told um, this very very mysterious passage with which again you can find all sorts of explanations. I don't know if there's a single explanation that doesn't leave you still scratching your head as what exactly it's all about. But let's read it from the chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when man began to increase upon the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of the rulers. um, Rulers, uh, I believe, is a translation of... Hold on one moment. Um... Okay, so B'nai Elohim. This translated as the sons of the rulers. Let's be let's be straightforward here and say the actual word in he- words in Hebrew are B'nai Elohim, the sons of gods, or it could be the sons of judges, because it's also the word Elohim is also used uh, not infrequently in the Torah to refer to judges. 
Um, and why is it called? Why are they called Elohim? Because their job is to try to translate the the will or the the wisdom of, of God into their into their rulings as judges. But um, so this translation, the sons of rulers, would is not incorrect. It's very, actually very insightful. But the actual wording is Bnei Elohim, which seems very unusual. Saw that the daughters of man were good, and they took for themselves wives from whomever they chose. And Hashem said, My spirit shall not contend evermore concerning man, since he is but flesh. His days shall be a hundred and twenty years. So this is where um, we're told that man will only live to 120 years, uh, something that God actually did not enact for a number of generations because of all of our forefathers lived for more than 120 years. Um, the first person that we are told um, lived 120 years was 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 Moshe. So let's just keep reading here. Um, and then it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Now this is another mysterious uh, Nephilim are usually considered to be giants. And there's a number of stories in the Torah and even in uh, in, in the books of the of the of the uh, prophets, uh, the stories of uh, the judges of, of and the son of uh, Samuel and David, etc., where these Nephilim, the Anakim giants, are mentioned. Something existed in this in the Middle East in those days. Uh, some kind of a very large human, um, and that's what these Nephilim seem to be, unless they are some kind of, you know, there's also the understanding they might have been fallen angels um, uh, of some sort around the earth in those days. And also afterwards, when the sons of the of the rulers or the Bnei Elohim would consort with the daughters of man who would bear to them, they were the mighty, who from old were men of devastation. Hashem saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth, and that every product of the thought of his heart was evil, but evil always. And Hashem reconsidered having made man on earth, and he had heartfelt sadness. And Hashem said, I will blot out man from whom I created from the face of the, of the earth, from man to animal to creeping things, and the birds of the sky, for I have reconsidered my having made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Hashem. In the Hebrew, it's Noach Matzah Chen. The word Chen is the same letters, just reversed as the word Noach. Noach Matzah Chen Be'enei Hashem. Okay, so that's how last week's parsha ended in this uh, very, very, very unusual description. All we know is that there was chaos on earth. Man was bad. Um, we're going to read... Uh, if, if we didn't just read it now, it'll be in one of the upcoming verses that there was Hamas and all the land. Hamas is an ancient Hebrew word that means um, it's taking, stealing by, by force, aggressive, violent theft. Um, and of course, it's very ironic, if you want to use that word, that if, of course one of Israel's arch enemies today is called Hamas. They call themselves Hamas. Um, and uh, so that evil force of Hamas has been in the world for a long, long time. And perhaps if we consider the uh, savage, brutal, inhumane evil of Hamas that we have witnessed, that we witnessed a year ago, um, and still witness, then we get an understanding of what was so, what went so wrong with mankind and why God had such a regret for creating man and said, enough of this. This experiment is over. But there was one human being, one man, who found favor in God's eye, and that was, cor of course, was Noah. And so the next verse in the Torah, verse, uh, um, verse, uh, nine, chapter six, the beginning of our parsha, parsha Noah, ve'elit. These are the offspring of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Ish Tzadik, perfect in his generations. Tamim Haya Badorotav. He was Tzadik and Tamim. Uh, I think he's the only. Uh, person in the Torah that received both of these titles, both of these descriptions, it doesn't get better than that. He's a tzaddik, he's righteous, and he's perfect, or or or, or pure. Um, and then we say that Noah walked with God, 
we, we read that Avraham walked with God. Um, actually, Avraham walked, um, I think it says, Lifnei Hashem. Here it says, Italich uh, Elohim, Italich Noach. Also, we read earlier that um, that Hanoch, Enoch, walked with Hashem, and w- and there was no more. And of course, tradition holds it that he uh, was translated into an angel uh, at that point. So he was another righteous man. Noah is righteous. And so God gives Noah instructions. We know the story. Everybody knows this. One of the most well-known stories, I think, on planet Earth, uh, the story of the flood. God gives uh, Noah, uh, he says there's going to be a flood. And he gives Noah uh, uh, very, very detailed instructions how to build an ark and uh, to bring all the animals onto the ark. And the flood begins, and Noah uh, and his wife and his three sons and their wives all enter the ark and all the animals two by two into the ark and then the flood begins and the waters rise and God opens up all the everything you know uh, there's uh, the water the mountains are covered it's this is it basically everything other than sea life right fish and other sea life everything that lived on the earth or even in the sky like the birds still need the earth everything was going to be wiped out except all those people and creatures that were on the ark. And then we read, after a description of the rising waters and how long it's been, uh, we read in chapter 8, verse 1, God remembered Noah and all the wildlife and domestic animals who were with him on the ark. God's okay. God remembered Noah. Vayiskor Elohim et Noah. Now, I find this to be one of the most terrifying verses in the entire Torah. Why? It sounds great. God remembered Noah. Well, if God remembered Noah a moment before that, had God forgotten Noah? That's a terrifying thought. thought The idea that that God could forget, could forget us. Now, I don't know if God forgets or not. All I do know is that uh, there are other times in the Torah when, for example, God remembered the children of Israel. Why? But then it says, God remembered the children of Israel because they cried out to him. God, the children of Israel in Egypt cried out to Hashem because they were, they were under brutal, brutal uh, uh, slavery. And they cried out to Hashem, and Hashem remembered his covenant with Avram, with Yitzhak, with Yaakov, and God was going to deliver them. Here, God remembered, and it's very interesting because Rashi on this verse says that uh, God remembers when 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 the righteous cry out, when the righteous pray to Him. But Noah didn't utter a word; he didn't say a word. In fact, the entire story of Noah, he does not say a single word. The first time he opens his mouth that we know of is when he gets drunk after the flood, after he's built a, a mizbeach, an altar, and offered offerings to Hashem, a, a righteous act for certain. And after that, he plants a a vineyard and he gets drunk. And the second time he opens his mouth is when he curses his son Canaan, Canaan, for having seen him in his nakedness. So this is very interesting. You have this righteous man, man who saved the entire, uh, the, the living creatures and all humanity and the father of us all. And as I said before, God's main reason for creating man was that man could use his power of, of speech in order to be partner with Hashem in creation and in perfecting creation and in perfecting himself. And God made all these efforts with Adam to get him to speak, you know, to jumpstart his power of speech. And to this day, uh, as Rashi pointed out, our power of prayer is so great that we can, even if we can imagine that God could forget, we can remind God. That's how important our words are. That's how important our prayer is. And yet, Noah did not utter an entire word, as far as we're told, throughout his entire life until he cursed his son. Um, Noah was righteous. In fact, you know, he didn't utter a word. That was probably a good thing. He didn't say the Shon Hara, he didn't say evil speech. Most likely, his generation was, was fully engaged in evil talk, in, in bad talk, in, in, in slander, in, in libel, and, and saying bad things about one another. He refrain from that. He was a righteous person. But he did not speak up. He did not, we, oftentimes we're told, you know, Avram, why did God choose Avraham to be the progenitor of his people and not Noah? Because Avraham 
were said, you know, when it came to uh, Sodom, Stom, uh, Avram said to God, what, you're going to just kill everybody? That's, that doesn't sound like justice to me, God. He spoke up on behalf of, of his, his fellow human beings. And we know that Avram, we're going to read about him very soon in the upcoming weeks, that he was very outspoken on behalf of all people. And, you know, so they compare him with Noah. Noah had all this time to prepare the people and say, listen, straighten up, get your act together, because there's going to be a flood. And he didn't. He built the ark, and some say, okay, by building the ark, people would come to him and say, you know, why are you doing this, you crazy guy? And he would say, because God's going to cause a flood, because you're all so rotten. Okay, perhaps. But in terms of what the Torah actually presents us with, he doesn't say a word. Now, Avraham, on the other hand, we're going to learn, he talks with everybody. He talks with his wife, Sarah. He talks with, with Hagar, the, 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 the maiden, the handmaiden of Sarah. He talks with his sons, Yishmael, and with, Yag, with Yitzchak. He talks with uh, um, Avimelech. He talks with, with Melchizedek. He talks with the, 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 the kings who are involved in the war. He talks with Lot, his nephew. He talks with Pharaoh. He talks with everybody. Uh, the list goes on. He was a talker. He talks with angels. He talks with God. He talked with God. Noah said not a word to God. It's very unusual. So Noah was a vehicle for Hashem to save the world. He was a good man. He was a good man, and, and his two greatest acts, I would say, are A, building the ark and bringing his family and, and all the creatures onto it. And his second great act was, uh, was building a mizbech, an altar, and, and making an offering to Hashem. And I would think it was those two great deeds which inspired Hashem to make a covenant with Noah and with all mankind, right? They were all B'nai Noah. We're all the sons of Noah with all mankind, a covenant that that we're told involves seven different um, commandments, um, six don'ts, uh, don't murder, don't steal, don't eat from a, a, a living creature, don't cut off a leg of an animal to eat, ever minachai it's called in Hebrew, um, uh, laws against adultery, and, and the one positive law was create laws of uh, a court, a courts of law. So you can have judge one another. You can have proper law, proper... Uh, this was what was missing in the generation of the flood. There was no... Nobody was in charge. Nobody was running things. Nobody was, was being a, accounted for. And you need... People need to appoint for themselves uh, other people who can... They can go to and appeal to when, when there's a problem. And uh, laws need to be made. So, yes, Noah was righteous, but he wasn't exactly the guy Hashem was looking for when it came to um, establishing a nation whom he would have a covenantal relation with and which would, that covenant would, would, would give to that people the responsibility to, to share and to teach the knowledge of Hashem to all mankind. Um, not to compel all mankind, God forbid, that, you know, they have to be, uh, uh, that they follow all the commandments that Israel would eventually receive. No, simply to, to share the knowledge of Hashem uh, with all mankind. And uh, that is the, the responsibility, the mission of the nation of Israel to this day. And as we know, and as God made very explicit, that the place Israel needs to do that from is the land of Israel, because that's where Israel can fulfill all its, uh, all the commandments, all the mitzvot that Hashem will give them. And of course, that leads us to right back to the very beginning, uh, the very verse of uh, first uh, verse of, of Bereshit, and the question that our sages have asked: Why do we start there? Why don't we start with the book of Exodus? Why don't we start with Israel gets its first commandment to, to to designate the first month to the to to designate the, the, the months by the moon, uh, which happens in the book of Exodus. And um, that's really what the Torah is all about. It's about the it's all about the commandments. But no, when we say that God created the heavens and the earth, we say that God owns the earth, owns the heavens, and God decides who's going to get what. And the people of Israel will get the land of Israel so they can fulfill the Torah of Israel for the sake of humanity. Thank you very much for being with me.